Hello, welcome to today's webinar on the National Science Foundation's Discovery Research Pre-K-12 Program Solicitation. I'm Catherine McCulloch from CADRE, which is the DRK-12 Programs Resource Center. We're hosting the webinar for NSF. We hope that you'll get answers to many of your proposal questions during the webinar. And since all attendees are muted, we ask that you submit your questions for NSF by writing them in the Q&A window. The Q&A window, chat box, and closed captioning options can all be accessed by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your Zoom window. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself and let us know if you need help with any technical issues throughout the webinar. Again, questions for our presenters should be asked in the Q&A window. Um, if you have any project-specific questions, however, we encourage you to email drldrk12 at nsf.gov rather than asking them here. We'll put that address in the chat box. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the slides and recording will be posted to cadreK12.org in our proposal toolkit, and we'll email them to uh, webinar registrants. The CADRE website also has resources for implementing projects, information about past and currently funded projects, and synopses of DRK-12 research. So we'll hope you explore the site. And with that, let's get started. Asla, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Catherine, and, and thank you, all the CADRE team, to help us prepare this webinar. And um, I want to also thank you and, and uh, for your interest in the DRK-12 program, and welcome to this webinar. It's one of the webinars that's part of a series that I'm going to talk in a little bit. And I'm Asla Cezanne Berry. I'm one of the co-leads of the DRK-12 program, and I'm joined by a few program officers in our DRK-12 program, uh, including Finbar Sloan, uh, Robert Russell, and Margaret Hajalmarsson. And uh, today, the, all of us will try to respond to your questions. And um, if there are questions that are not responded yet, as, as Catherine mentioned, we have a DRL, DRK12 at nsf.gov email address that you're welcome to send your questions and inquiries. And um, before I start my slides, which will give you some overview information about the new solicitation and also components of, uh, of DRK-12 proposal, I wanna tell you that we have changed our due date. Uh, in our previous years, we had the DRK-12 proposals due October. And now uh, with the new solicitation, our due date is gonna be November. And for this year, it's gonna be November 8th, uh, uh, 2023. So I we hope that this uh, new de deadline is going to be uh, is helping you to build your partnerships to uh, to submit your proposals. And um, let's see. So uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the webinars of a series of other webinars and and uh, office hours that are designed to provide outreach on the new solicitation. Uh, we did have one on July 20th, and this is the one July 25th that uh, that you're just joining that will provide you some technical support, overview some of the information about what you need to know uh, preparing your proposal. And then in August 7 and 15, we will have office hour sessions where you can come and ask your questions. And then uh, you can also develop and send your one page con uh, concept papers or project summaries to drldrk12 at nsf.gov and uh, and we'll we'll you know assign a program officer to that concept paper and and we'll uh, give you feedback on that concept paper and uh, there are other resources and we'll point to these resources throughout this webinar uh, so one of them that uh, cadre has is called nsf proposal toolkit uh, this includes key information and resources one of which is the proposal development timeline we encourage you to look at these resources they're really helpful uh, on, in building your proposals and then we have another resource center EQ eqr evidence quality and reach hub uh, that also provides, you know, learning events, theory, uh, services, or other resources related to research methods, a variety of research methods, knowledge translation, knowledge mobilization, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So you can also utilize these resources in thinking about or building your proposals. Another uh, fun and uh, an interesting resource that we have uh, is video podcast that's also, uh, you know, uh, provided by Cadre uh, that basically tells you a little bit about, you know, uncovering the hidden curriculum of the DRK-12. 
uh, pulse panel pop off. That's an interesting one to listen to. Uh, it's it's available at the cadre website. So um, with uh, pointing out to those resources about preparing Soul Station, now I want to give you a little bit of information on the critical changes that we have in this new version of the DRK-12 Soul Station. The very first one is that we added a new project type. And this is a partnership development project type. We were aware that it is it takes a long time to build partnership with uh, with stakeholders that you're working with. These can be uh, school leaders, school district leaders, teachers, uh, or or you know youth. Sometimes the student groups, etc. And we want to make sure that you can have this opportunity to build a research design, a proposal for a a future submission. These proposals are only for one year. And, uh, and it can be up to $100,000. And uh, the second uh, change in the new solar station is to emphasize the programmatic commitment to research and teaching strand as a STEM workforce development. So now we want to consider STEM teachers also part of the STEM workforce development. And another thing that was a change to the dissemination plan of the proposals, as you know, the RK12 always had this dissemination plan component, but now with this new soul station, we expect PIs to focus on knowledge mobilization. We wanna see how uh, the, the practitioner voices or the voices uh, who are not typically represented can uh, bring up in these proposals and there's more of a reciprocal translation of knowledge built in different fields, different uh, sectors. So uh, we're, we're really looking for an equitable approach to dissemination uh, with this new soul station. And then another thing that's a change with this uh, soul station is that assessment is no longer a strand. It was one of the strands before. Now it's going to be a project type uh, because uh, we heard from the field that it was really hard to uh, separate assessment from learning or teaching. So we are now putting assessment to a project type and we'll have only two strands. And then also, you know, we do all of our project types have some updates. So I encourage you strongly to read the new cell station before you start writing your full proposal. So um, one thing I want to plug in here uh, is to serve as an NSF reviewer, especially if you haven't, you know, haven't received an NSF award. But even if you did, because we do have all these changes it's really helpful uh, to sit on a panel and learn during the panel. And if you are interested in serving uh, as an NSF reviewer, uh, please send an email to drldrk12 at nsf.gov, which is our um, allies email address. You can include a, a three to five pages description of your expertise and, and you know a brief CV so that we can understand what your uh, background is and what areas you might be interested in, in serving. And uh, this is, you know, it's a paid service and it's service to the field. It's a service to your field, to your colleagues, to, to give them and to provide a high quality review. That's a, that's a big priority for us at NSF to provide high quality reviews and feedback to the PIs and basically being part of these panels also help us accomplish that goal. And then also really sitting on the panels help with understanding the review process. How does that work? Uh, how do people kind of, you know, voice their comments and then how those comments get basically uh, lead to the write up of, of the panels uh, summary. And, um, and then another thing that these uh, panels help with is understanding the specific program requirements. You know, when we hold panels, we do realize uh, reviewers would say, oh, you know, this program is different in X, Y, and Z way. So that's, uh, it's sitting on these panels really help you uh, understand that kind of um, idea of what is specific, what's unique, and uh, what, what sets a program aside and, and different than the others. And also, it's a great networking opportunity. Although we've been uh, mostly holding these uh, panels as uh, virtually, I would still hear from the field that you know that after they sat on the panel, they they networked, they realized that they have common interests, and uh, and they even you know started talking and collaborating. So it is a great networking opportunity. 
And the, the workload is uh, slightly different in the virtual panels where um, a lot of uh, the panels only assign six to eight proposals to, to reviewers. Uh, you know, I, I'm saying only I know that it's still a big commitment and um, an important work, uh, but I wanted to say it used to be a larger number when we hold in person panels. And uh, you are providing substantive written reviews for the proposals that you're assigned to, and this is typically a two day interactive virtual or in person panel. So far, most of our panels are virtual um, and you know that might be the that might likely be the case coming year as well. Um, and then uh, one thing that's important to note, you cannot serve as a reviewer if you are a senior personnel um, on a proposal uh, that that's submitted for that cycle of the of the uh, the program. So make sure that you know when you're committing to be a reviewer, you're not a senior personnel, you're not a PI, you're not a co-PI uh, for for um, for any proposal during that cycle. And um, I do want to kind of uh, go back and tell you a little bit of information about the DRK-12 proposal. And uh, one thing to note that our DRK-12 program is under DRL division, which is Division for Research on Learning at Formal and Informal Settings. And this division is under the EDU, STEM Education Directorate. And the STEM Education Directorate has a certain mission and, and makes investments towards that mission. And this mission statement, as you see on my slide here, is to develop a diverse and well-prepared U.S. STEM workforce and STEM literate public by supporting excellent research and development in STEM education. And some areas that are aligned with this mission is STEM learning and learning environments, um, and also uh, projects that are aiming for broadening participation and institutional capacity, and also STEM professional workforce development. These are three areas that aligns with our uh, mission. Oops, sorry. Um, so what is then unique about our program, DRK-12? So a lot of programs will align with the mission that I just talked about. But one thing that is critically unique about the DRK-12 program is its focus on pre-K-12 formal education which is in all areas of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, so when you're writing your proposals for DR DRK-12, make sure that the focus, the focal context is in the formal education. And we do invite proposals that address immediate challenges facing this pre-K-12 uh, STEM education. And, you know, as I mentioned, specifically the formal education environments or policies that govern those, uh, those environments. And we expect that these proposals uh, will anticipate radically different structures and functions of pre-K-12 teaching and learning. And here you see, we do have a, uh, a sentence in our solicitation uh, that says, we expect solicitation, we expect proposals, studies, projects that demonstrate a well-rounded understanding of the day-to-day -day work and expertise of the educators in formal teaching and learning contexts, the talents and the needs of the nation's diverse student population, their communities, and national, state, or district priorities. So uh, we do expect uh, your people in your senior personnel, people who are PIs, co-PIs, will have an, a good understanding, a well-established understanding of the formal education system and the, the people who work in this formal education system. And, um, and also we do invite proposals that will advance opportunities for all pre-K-12 students and teachers to develop their STEM talent. So our major goal for the DRK-12 program is that uh, we wanna catalyze research and development that enhances all pre-K-12 teachers and their students' opportunities to engage in high quality learning experiences related to all fields of, this, uh, all fields of STEM. And relatedly, we determined a few objectives that kind of attends to variety of project types we have. So the, the first one is about building knowledge that will help us understand how to develop pre-K-12 students and teachers STEM content knowledge, practices, and skills. And the other thing 
which has kind of gotten strengthened and highlighted more with the partnership uh, uh, partnership building project type is to support collaborative partnerships among STEM education researchers, STEM education practitioners, and uh, school leaders. Um, and then you can also extend this to families as well if they if the proposal again is focusing on the formal education system. And then the third objective is to be able to build a field of STEM education by supporting projects like knowledge syntheses and development of novel and robust assessment of teacher and student learning engagement and skills. So as I mentioned, this will relate to a variety of project types we have, but these are our critical objectives uh, for DRK-12 program. And then uh, the outcomes that we would expect from our projects will be research-based, evidence-based products uh, that are promising, uh, or, or these can be methods that can be used by others in, in the field or practitioners. And, and these outcomes, we want them to support the success of all teachers and all students. Uh, these outcomes can be curriculum, teaching and research tools, physical tool, conceptual tools, or models of collaboration, especially through uh, some of these partnership uh, proposals. So here is a bit of a recap uh, and a visual representation of what the new uh, strand project type and funding level looks look like. So we do have two strands right now. We used to have three, but now it's just teaching and learning. We do understand that sometimes your teaching pro teaching strand proposals might also have a question or might also attend to student learning. Uh, or vice versa, you, we might see a proposal that's a learning strand, but might have a goal, activity, professional development for teacher. You need to decide based on the focus of your project, which one of these strands you belong to and, and choose and label the strand for your proposals. And then uh, we have project type category. So you basically choose your strand and then you choose your project type based on what the goals of your project are. And uh, we have some of our project types that was also in the previous solicitation, such as exploratory, design and development, impact projects, implementation and improvement. As I mentioned before, measurement and assessment is a new project type. And this can be under either teaching or learning strand. And the measurement and assessment uh, project type can be assessments for STEM learning or assessments of STEM learning. So both of those categories are, uh, are something, you know, are, are proposals that we, uh, we like to see. And then synthesis was also in the, in the previous um, solicitation, but once again, all of these have updated definitions in the new solicitation. And then uh, we have partnership development, which is a new project type. Uh, this is a, you know, a critical uh, goal for NSF, uh, but, and also for our program. So we wanna see uh, researchers building strong relationships with schools and uh, other stakeholders that will be critical for the projects and take that year to be able to build that before they apply to any of the other categories, um, any of the other project type categories. And then workshops and conferences was also from the previous solicitation. So then uh, you determine a funding level based on the scope of your project, you know, how, how many participants, what context you're working on, what your goals are. Uh, funding levels are in the, independent of the project type. You choose it based on the needs of your project, which will be, you know, again, justified in your budget. Uh, it, you know, what, what you will need, how many years you will need, et cetera. So we have uh, our, you know, funding level one, which will be limited to 450,000. Then we have level two that's limited to $3 million, which can be up to four years, and then $5 million, which will be up to five years. And then we have synthesis projects that will be up to 600,000 years, and it can be limited to uh, three years. The partnership development one will be up to 100, uh, $100,000 that will be limited to just one year. And the workshops and conference proposals used to be a, a lower amount. And now with this new solicitation, we raised that level up to $200,000. Uh, just hearing from the field on the arrangements of the, the conference uh, planning. So that's also another um, difference that we have on our funding levels. So um, 
now that I, you know, walk you through a little bit of the, the specifics of the DRK-12 program and the project expectations, we are going to move to the proposal preparation and the review process. And we'll give you some overview on that um, front as well. So the first thing that I want to highlight for this section is that there is another critical document. So we're not just going with the solicitation, uh, you know, when we when we think about what needs to be in the proposal or how do we write a proposal, but we also look at uh, another document that we refer to as PEPG, but it it refers it's uh, it stands for Proposal and Award Policies and Procedures Guide. So and this is another document that I strongly suggest that, you know, for those of you who are uh, planning your proposals, please read this one. This is a document that gets updated um, annually. Uh, and, and there's the one that's currently in effect is going to be NSF 23-1. Uh, if you search for NSF PEPG and, and look at the, you know, the number, you should be able to locate this one. And, and I'm sure cadre folks are also putting the link on the chat as well. And this document really sets the policy for submitting, so, uh, submitting proposals to NSF. And our solicitation supersedes the PEPG. So we also need to follow uh, the guidance on PEPG to write our solicitation, but there might be further information and details on some of the aspects of the, uh, the, the proposal or eligibility, et cetera, that you can find or how to prepare your budget uh, on, on, and you can find all of these on this uh, PAPG document. And another thing I want to note is that any organization who would submit a DRK-12 proposal should have a unique entity identifier, which can be uh, received at the sam.gov. And uh, you need to be an active, your organization needs to be an active registrant in, in this uh, website. And um, right now, what we've been hearing that our general uh, services administration is experiencing a lot of uh, workload and, and that they're experiencing a backlog. So if you are a new organization, you don't have UIN number, uh, please register as soon as possible. Uh, or, you know, tell your uh, basically uh, organizations that uh, this number should be received for you to be able to submit a proposal through your institution, your organization. And um, another thing, uh, which has been the case for a while now, that all proposals must be submitted using research.gov or grants.gov. So we don't use Fastlane anymore. You can use either one of these websites to submit your proposal. And um, the eligibility criteria, this is from the PEPG document. And once again, there are more details on the PEPG. So I, I suggest you to look at that before you apply. Um, and one thing to, uh, to mention, any organization is eligible to apply, but individuals cannot apply for the DRK-12 funding by themselves. Uh, and once again, the institution needs to be uh, registered at the SEM.gov system so that you can apply um, through your institution. And also these uh, organizations or institutions must demonstrate an acceptable accounting mechanism in place to be recommended for funding uh, when we have our financial reviews. And then there are some resources, links um, on this document as well that you see on the website. And, uh, and I'm gonna ask cadre uh, staff to put some of these links on the chat as well, that you can find more information on what it means to be, uh, to have, to demonstrate acceptable accounting mechanism. Uh, so these are some of the, you know, the eligibility mechanisms that you would see laid out on the PEPG document. Um, so as I move to my next slide, I'm gonna uh, have uh, my colleague Margaret to uh, to present you some of the uh, the critical information about proposal preparation. Thank you, Margaret. Hi there. So just as a quick reminder um, from part of what Oslo talked about, um, there's two documents you need to be looking at when you're putting together your proposal. The one is the DRK-12 solicitation that talks about the requirements for this specific program. And then the second one is the NSF um, PAPG, the Proposal and Award Policy and Procedures Guide um, that's updated regularly, um, which gives you information about any NSF proposal um, 
but you know, as Asla said, the DRK-12 solicitations might deviate somewhat. Um, if you have questions about those deviations, you can um, write to the DRK-12 email, email address, but um, those two documents should have everything you need to know about putting together um, a proposal. So the basic required elements, and there's more details um, in the PAPG about these, um, are the project description. This is probably where you'll spend most of your time um, writing this 15 page narrative, which talks about um, the importance of your project. There's a couple required sections. One is if you've had prior NSF support. Um, another is the section about broader impacts. Um, you only need to talk about your research design, um, what you're trying to do um, as an intervention or, or what, your, what your research approach is. Um, and then any kind of mechanisms to assess success. I'll talk about those in a little bit um, more later. Um, and then your communication and dissemination plan. And as Asla said, um, part of the DRK-12 solicitation is looking at knowledge mobilization. So that can be part of that section as well. So that 15 page narrative is the core of what you're gonna submit that describes um, what you would like to do um, and what kind of project you're doing. The other thing you'll submit um, is a project summary, which is one page with two required sections, intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, and this is, you could think of this like the abstract of your project. So it's the brief short description to orient um, program staff and reviewers to what your project is about. So it should be um, as specific to your project as possible to give us a sense um, of what you're trying to do. Um, and then there's some other sections, references, um, good news about references is you get as many pages as you would like for references, but they need to all be references. Um, and then some other documents that are required in terms of budget, um, facilities, senior personnel. Um, we'll go through some of these. Okay. So like I said, the project summary, you'll need to talk about, give an overview of the project. This should help us see um, you know, which strand are you thinking about? Which STEM discipline are you thinking about working on? Um, what is the grade or age level that you're working with? Um, and if there's anything notable or, or specific about the participant characteristics, so are they brand new teachers? Are they students with autism? Um, are they pre-service teachers? Um, so your project, and then your project characteristics. So if you have particular partners you're working with, um, or if you're focusing on a particular type of community, that can all be in the overview as, as a, an abstract about what you're trying to do. Um, and then the two NSF merit review criteria, you give short descriptions of intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, and you'll need separate statements of those. The next thing you'll need is a mechanism to assess success. So what does that mean? So this means you're getting external feedback um, on your project. Um, an external review about how your project is going throughout the life of the project. So this could be an external review panel or an advisory board um, or a third party evaluator. The choice between those will depend on what kind of project you're trying to do and what's the most appropriate kind of feedback for that project type. Um, so part of what our, our reviewers and program staff will look for is, you know, is this explained well um, and does it seem well connected and linked to um, the work you're trying to do? Does it make sense to collect the data they're trying to collect relative to the kind of project you're doing? The external review should be, oh. <laughs> go back. Sorry. <laughs> All right. um, the external review should be um, independent and rigorous so it can influence your project activities um, and, and improve the quality of the findings. Um, you should talk about the expertise of the reviewers or your advisory board um, and how that connects to the project. Next slide. Um, supplementary documents. So if you have um, partners that you're working with, for example, a school district, um, you would want a letter of collaboration from them. Um, the other kind of letter of collaboration would be from an advisory board member or external reviewer. Um, you can also include a list of all the personnel. Um, and then there's two documents required for all NSF proposals. One is a data management plan um, that talks about what the data you're gathering, how you're going to store it, how you're going to share it, 
Um, and then if you're hiring a postdoctoral researcher, you'll need to attach a mentoring plan for them. Um, and we put in yellow that no other documents, so don't attach anything else. I know the 15 pages is not enough, but um, everybody's turning in the same 15 pages, so um, don't attach anything else um, with your proposal as a supplement. That's Those are the only four kinds of things you should have. Um, budget. So we get a lot of questions about budget. Um, and the first thing to know is that they should be consistent with the level of the work. Um, you don't have to request the maximum budget. Um, you can request a number less than $3 million. Um, you could request $1.5 million and that's okay. It needs to align with the work you're doing. Um, the next thing is that you should have no more than two months of salary for your senior personnel across all NSF grants unless you've presented some kind of justification within the budget justification document. Another thing um, our reviewers have been looking, looking at is how um, teachers and other school district personnel are being compensated fairly um, and meaningfully um, within, your, within your budget. So how are the people you're collaborating with um, compensated as part of that partnership? Next one. So for everybody who's senior personnel, you need to attach a bio sketch, um, current and pending support that talks about what other grant funding people have um, or other kinds of support they have, um, and then the collaborators and other affiliations. And all of these help, help us in the review process situate this grant proposal within the other kinds of work you might be doing. Um, there's templates for all of them, um, and you'll see full guidance in the path G. Um, so reasons we might return something without review. So this means we've gotten your proposal and there's some problem with it that um, means we won't send it out to reviewers. Um, the first thing would be any kind of violation of the basic formatting of the PAPG. So it should be less than 15 pages, for example. Um, a second one, if it's too similar to a previously submitted proposal. So if it was reviewed last year for DRK-12, then you need to make some changes to what you're submitting this time in terms of reviewer feedback. Um, it also needs to be different than a proposal you might have submitted, say, to the EDU core research program. Um, they can be related topics, but this work needs to be independent from other proposals. Um, other things, um, no postdoc plan, no data management plan, um, if you have extra supplementary documents, we might return it without review, those kinds of things. Basically follow the instructions and we won't have a problem. So as an overview of our review process, um, we're gonna be at step three in, in November. On November 8th, we'll have received your proposal. And then from that point, um, the program staff will meet and organize the panels into the proposals into panels um, and select reviewers. Most of them will be put on a panel. Some of them might get just ad hoc review. Um, and then after the peer review process is over, the program officers make recommendations. Um, we look at the whole portfolio of what we're trying to fund. Um, and our division director, we, we discuss with him what we're trying to fund. Um, and then after the program officer and the division director have made a recommendation, um, it goes to the divisions of grants and agreements, um, and they're the last stop um, before an award is made. Um, we attempt to do all of that within six months, but various things happen, and, and sometimes it takes a little bit longer than that. Um, but you should plan to, um, plan to hear from us um, no less than six months. Um, from when you submit. Go ahead. Any questions? Right. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Yeah, we uh, we have about like 10 to 15 minutes to respond to some of the questions. I saw that uh, both about Bob and Barry were responding to uh, the, the questions on the Q&A, but we can probably uh, respond to them you know here and and you know a lot of you can hear that as well um like i i see one that um that i might i'm you know i, I think i'm 
this might be a good question for Barry, uh, the one about the assessment project type that we uh, right now define it as assessment of and for teaching and learning. So, um, so this uh, potential PI is asking about the difference between of and for distinction. And I wonder if we can get Barry on the screen and, and he can provide yeah, us some response. Yeah. Right. So you, you might think of um, those as mapping to summative and formative uh, uses of assessment. So you can have a, assessment of what has been learned and you can have assessment for what will be learned. Um, functionally, the assessments just serve two different purposes. One is more summative in nature. It's what have students learned and the other is in the service of how can we support better student learning. Uh, I, I think that's the simplest way to parse that. Um, and, and I will leave it at that. I, I think what's most important is that while assessment doesn't show up as a strand, it is a, an object that we're, we're really concerned about and we do want to see submissions in that category. If you have any more specific questions, feel free to just drop me an email at f s l o a n e at nsf. Gov. Thank you, Barry. Uh, Margaret or Bob, did you want to add anything to the assessment of and for distinction? No. So, so I think, you know, that was a pretty, you know, um, like a, you know, a way to kind of differentiate those two. And also it might depend on the unique goals of the project, how you can situate it, uh, assessment of versus for, and definitely, uh, you know, discuss with your program officer uh, and, and thank you, Barry, for providing a contact information as well. And um, I did see another question about the two month budget cap that is right now um, for the PIs and co-PIs for, for particularly for people who are uh, working at universities who have a research component. I did see that, Bob, you, you provide an answer, but do you mind um, talking about that a little bit to the group? Let's see. I'm sorry. Which question? Are uh, the question. Please? Sorry. Uh, I can I can actually read the question. Many NSF proposals assume that PIs and co-PIs are tenure track faculty, such as stating the two month budget cap is for tenure track faculty. Are there any guides or resources for other researchers who want to apply, uh, such as those from nonprofit um, organizations or or K twelve district leaders? Well, in general, you simply have you you have to provide uh, you know an an argument for why the amount of time requested you know you should make a statement you know that more more than two months salary support is being requested for the individual, and then uh, the justification is that our organization uh, is entirely funded by uh, grant funding and. The level of work required for this position is greater than two months per year where that is requested. You can add a little more detail than that, but it's basically uh, the most important part is to justify the amount of salary in relation to the amount of work done. And then if it's if it, the person is a tenured faculty member or or is receiving university support then you you know you may have you may want to have a course buyout or something you know to replace so the you know NSF doesn't want to pay more than for 12 months salary so that's part of the argument there and then just a reminder that this applies across all NSF supported research so it's not just this proposal but if you know you might claim one month in this proposal but if you've got uh additional time in other proposals well that also counts in the two months Thank you, Bob. Um, if there isn't anything else from Margaret or Barry, I'm going to move on to another question. So, okay, seems like they're uh, giving me approval to move on. Uh, so there's one question about the distinction between collaborative versus subaward, um, and I'm going to start by saying that when when it is a collaborative proposal, each institution or organization that is part of the collaborative needs to sub needs to do the submission separately. And then um, and then I'm going to turn to other program officers to provide some explanation and their understanding of the distinction between collaborative and sub award. Um, 
Let me see. Margaret, do you want to start off? Yeah. So um, a collaborative is one type where each institution will receive funds from NSF. So you'll have two different award numbers, but they're linked. And this is all described in the PAPG, how to set that up. And then if you have a sub-award, that's um, to one organization and say the university would get the money and then the university um, sends it to the sub-awardee organization. So that one gets one award number. And both of these are described in the PAPG. I think people use the sub-award when, um, say it's an evaluator, for example, or evaluation company, something that's a smaller contract. A collaborative might be when you have two people at different or universities and they're each doing um, components of the project in more of a, an equal partnership kind of way, um, but either is fine. Um, it, it's sort of what makes the most sense for your particular project. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah. Um, any other additions, Bob or Barry, on the distinction between sub-award versus collaborative that you want to make? Uh, no, no. Okay. The, the The central difference is who has which organization has the responsibility for overseeing the work, uh, the promised work. So, it, a, oh, yeah, Margaret, fire away. No problem. Oh, I was going to say, there's also a question about sub awards to international universities, and the quick answer is yes. There's paperwork. And um, it's all described yes. in the PAPG if you're doing a sub award to somebody yeah. at a US, non US I, institution. You, you can, but there's there are also caveats that, uh, as I understand it, the NSF, other than very in, than in very specific scenarios, in particular Canada, will will not underwrite indirect costs for foreign for foreign institutions. Oh, okay. Yeah, and also for the international sub awards, um, the process basically asks us also to define what will be the benefit of the sub awardees organization or expertise to the US context. So that will be something that you will need to explain in what ways the sub awardees bringing a unique expertise or uh, or somehow there's a lab or a, uh, or tools that exist outside of the US that 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 you need to use for your own project, which otherwise like make it impossible for your project to occur if you don't have that international partnership um, or, or sub award. So those are the things that you know you should be able to talk um, in your uh, in your proposal as well. Um, and then one other question that we can look at is. Um, for a resubmission, where do you discuss how you have done mod how you have done modifications in the proposal in line with the reviewer's suggestions? Do you um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Bob? Oh, I can take that one. So first of all, you don't need to explicitly respond to reviewer comments from a prior submission. You can do that if you choose to do that, but you also need to remember that you're taking up part of your 15 pages to do that. So that's that's your call as a PI. Uh, so it's whatever you feel will make a stronger argument for your proposal. Uh, you may you, the main thing is that you take the reviewer comments from the prior submission into account and and try to address them to the degree possible in your revision. And you know, and you you have to, and it's your judgment on the reviewer's comments. You don't necessarily need to respond to every single comment someone makes. Maybe maybe one comment was not actually on target. You know, reviewers aren't perfect, and if you have four or five reviews, well, you'll receive probably, you know, 30 or 40 separate comments. So, um, so you just have to review those carefully and try to respond, you know, as best as you can in your revision. And then if you want to highlight several of the high level issues that were responded to, again, that's your call, but, you know, you may want to decide if, this, if you want to take up a page or two in doing that, you know, and then having only 13 pages, let's say, uh, for presenting all the required items. The, all the required items. Yeah, and I, would, and I, oh, go ahead, Margaret, go ahead. I was going to say, so Daryl had a follow up about access to prior reviews. So that raises an important, this is a very different process than paper or article revisions where you're submitting something to a journal. 
and you might be working with the same editor who will find the same reviewers. So in this case, for an NSF proposal, you won't necessarily have the same reviewers. It might not be the same program officer. Um, you know, it, it depends on the, the group of proposals we get each year, how they get sorted into panels. Um, so the, pre, the new reviewers won't have access to the previous reviews because it's a, as far as we're concerned, it's a brand new submission. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would just quickly add that um, it is, I, we see that it is helpful for, uh, you know, the PIs to contact the program officer on the unit reviews and, and have they are, are they planning to revise their proposal for the next round of submission um, and then talk through if, you know, as Bob said, there are comments that maybe not on target or, or you, you think that maybe, you know, you actually have it, but how to maybe highlight it in the new revision. So it will be helpful to have a follow up meeting with program officer to discuss the reviews that you received. Uh, Bob. Yeah. Was that what you were going to say? No, yeah, I mean, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> All right. uh, let's see, Barry or Margaret, is there anything else you want to add in terms of the questions that we responded so far? Sounds like um, I, I can just make one point. Not a, nobody asked this question, but um, one thing one thing that I think program officers officers appreciate is knowing what the inter intervention is. Often, uh, you know, there might be several dense pages on the research design, which is probably appropriate, but uh, there might only be like one or two paragraphs on what the actual intervention is. You know, like the professional development program what you know what's the content and what's the nature of the pd experience the same thing for curriculum um so if you don't have an i you know if the learning experience itself isn't very clear it's hard to tell what uh what is being researched and if that environment has the potential for resulting in the intended impacts based on the the theoretical approach and rationale Thank you, Bob. Thank you all uh, who raised questions and, and thank you to the program officers who are um, responding to them. Um, so let's see, uh, we have a few more slides to go through for this webinar. Uh, that's mostly about the reminders and the resources that you can uh, sorry, find. Sorry, sorry, Ashley, before you go there, we have tried to respond either in real time or orally to the to the questions that were posed in the chat. Or, um, However, I would like to ask if there are one, any other questions and or whether we missed a question that we that we should follow up on. So if someone has posed a question and it wasn't and we didn't discuss and or that we didn't respond to in writing, uh, could they repose the question so we could answer them now before we close? Um, yeah, if there's anyone who wants to bring back their question, we have a few more minutes. Uh, if, if you want to do that, you can post it on the Q&A. And also, you know, I'll, I'll mention this on my, you know, reminder as well that, you know, that we can definitely have ask follow up questions through our LI's email as well. But if there is any of your questions or comments, you want to bring it to um, bring back to the group, uh, you're welcome to post it uh, in, in the next minute or so, so we can uh, look at it. Uh, can I just mention or ask if if uh, it was suggested to potential proposers that they can send in a one or two pager to the DRL? Let's see, what is it? Uh, what is the email? Concept paper or project summary. Oh, DRL, DRK12 at NSF.gov. So you can send in a one pager and then I think maybe that was mentioned earlier, and then you you can you will get a call set up with a program officer, and they can walk through your proposal and give you some car targeted feedback based on your specific idea. Afla, there's a question about developing partnerships and how the eight pager is different from the fifteen page submission. I don't know if we answered that. Yeah, we. I don't think we did. Um, so I'll try and take a stab at that. Go ahead, Bear. Yeah, all NSF submissions will have to attend to the intellectual merit and the broader impacts of, of the proposal, obvious, which would then sort of give a sense for what the outcome of the spent $100,000 would be so that you could articulate well who the likely partners are, how often you're going to meet with them, 
how you will build up this uh, working relationship and ensure that questions that are of value to, in those partnerships are not just to the researcher, but also to the partner. But again, you'd still have to, you'll have to have an abstract, you'll have to have the intellectual merit and broader impact of the work and all the other categories that Margaret and uh, Nasla and, and Bob referred to. So if you're go if you would like, a, if you think you're gonna have a postdoc on this, you'd, you'd invite the postdoc into these conversations. If you're gonna be working with graduate students in this process, you would bring graduate students in there and their roles should be explicit and taken up in the appropriate budget justification documents. Thank you, Barry. Is there anything else, Margaret, did you want to add to that? One one thing I do also want to mention, I guess you do basically adhere to all, all the project type, the major components that we list, even if it's a shorter one. Uh, it's, it's a slightly different write-up uh, in terms of its research, for example. Uh, but one thing also you can consider uh, writing about the activities that will help build the partnership too, to make it, you know, more visible to the um, to the reviewers on what Absolutely. you're planning to do to actually okay. build the partnership. Yeah, what that does is that uh, it, that explains your approach towards achieving the outcomes or impacts that you want to have as a result of developing the partnership. All right. Um, since we have less than 10 minutes, I'm going to move on to uh, finishing uh, slides. But definitely, if you do still have questions or questions come up, uh, you can post it on the Q&A. Uh, Bob and Barry was uh, really great at responding to them. And, and Margaret Margaret is also responding to them, as I see. And uh, and then once again, if you do need a follow up, you can um, you know, send emails as well. So uh, just a few reminders and, and resources that will be helpful to you in preparing your uh, proposals this summer uh, or in the fall. Uh, so just a reminder, again, this webinar is just one of the, the series of webinars uh, that we, we kind of created for our outreach plan, and you will have an opportunity or uh, actually now dates we know, I just posted on my first slide, we have August 7 and 15 at 1 p.m. We have office hours that you can hop in or your pro other project members can come in and ask questions about this proposal, about this solicitation, uh, which is once again a new solicitation this year. And uh, as Bob also highlighted, you can send your one page concept papers, project summaries to our LI's email DRL, DRK12 at NSF.gov. We will send them to the program officer who has an expertise in, in the area of your proposal. And again, there are additional resources to help you uh, prepare your solicitation. Uh, Cadre has NSF proposal toolkit. And uh, our EQR hub uh, has also a variety of webinars, uh, services that helps you understand how to talk about your research, how to determine your research design, and sometimes you know uh, have a deep dive into some of the specific research methodologies and how to also attend to diversity, equity, and inclusion in your uh, proposals. And once again, there are. Uh, podcasts that talks a little bit into the experiences of people managing or, or writing the pro, uh, the proposals. So check those out um, to basically help you write your proposal. And then um, again, uh, be uh, consider being a reviewer. That's really helpful for us to achieve our goal to, to give high quality feedback to the field. Um, and um, and we had really great reviewers in the past and, and we wanna make sure we keep having that. Uh, for that also, you'll use the same email. If you have an interest in reviewing, write to drldrk12 at nsf.gov with, um, with a short CV and a, a brief overview of your ex, you know, experience and your background. And then, um, as, as I mentioned, there are a lot of benefits to this, not that you are, this is your service to the field, which is not enough money, but you, you know, you get just paid a little bit as an, as a token of appreciation. And then, um, there is also, you know, really understanding the review process, how it goes and what, what our new solicitation will require and how those proposals are attending to this and, uh, being able to 
uh, do networking with colleagues who are in the similar uh, area of research. And uh, workload, again, it's going to be six to eight proposals. Uh, you'll be required to write written reviews for those and attend two-day uh, panel, uh, which will likely be virtual um, unless otherwise will be stated. And once again, you cannot serve as a reviewer if you're a senior personnel or a um, or a uh, peak, you know, or co, uh, co PI or PI on the on the projects of this cycle. And uh, thank you again. Uh, we do uh, wish you best in and being able to complete your proposals and making it the way that you actually like and, and you're proud of. And um, and remember again, both for being the reviewer and also if you do have follow up questions as you're building your concept papers and proposals, contact us at DRL, DRK12 at NSF.gov. Uh, our program officers are really generous. They're you know welcome to respond to your concept papers and provide you uh, feedback on, on your proposals. Yeah, hey, also let me add in that program officers aren't mean. We, most of us are really nice, so consider us a friendly, friendly place to contact. You know, to get feedback on your proposals. Yeah, they're not scary. I do hear sometimes uh, my panelists would say I used to be scared of program officers, but hopefully uh, we gave you a little bit of a taste that we're not really scary. So do contact uh, to us if you have follow up questions. Come to the office hours as well. Uh, some of us will be there, and um, and that's a great opportunity to uh, to basically you know be able to ask your uh, questions and understand uh, the details of this uh, new cell station. Um, and as I'm finishing up, I just want to you know see Margaret or Barry. I don't know if you wanted to say a word um, to close up. No, thanks everybody. Okay. Right. Best wishes um, to all. Thank you. Thank you. And um, all right. Have a great day, everyone. And, and we're looking forward to hearing from you and, and seeing your proposals.